Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromycel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromycel technology. The All Eyes Visual All VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields, acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. With more screen usage and indoor time, myopia, also known as nearsightedness, is increasing and getting worse in children. Now, certified eye doctors can prescribe my sight one day, the first and only FDA-approved soft contact lens to slow myopia progression in age-appropriate children. Visit coopervision.com to find a Brilliant Futures certified eye doctor near you. Do your patients know what presbyopia is? There are people who are afraid of the press. Have you talked to your patients about multifocal contact lenses? I've heard the bifocal, but not right, multifocal. Exactly. Not multifocal. Do you need help with your multifocal strategy? Learn more at the conclusion of this episode. Welcome back to part two of my interview with Dr. David Minkoff. In this episode, Dr. Minkoff explains his favorite health healing diet and a novel treatment for cardiovascular disease. If you're new here and you like our interviews, press like, subscribe, share, and hit the bell. Also, please leave comments. Be sure to watch our full-length documentary, Open Your Eyes on Amazon Prime, Apple TV, iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube movies and shows. The number one killer, or really the number two killer, is heart disease after uh, after doctors and hospitals and medications. Right. Uh, so so with heart disease, what are some of the, the earliest signs? Is it really cholesterol? Because about half the people that die have normal from a heart attack have normal cholesterol. So is cholesterol really our enemy? And what can we do to prevent heart disease or heart attacks? So modern medicine is built on a financial model. What makes money gets promoted and cholesterol is in this basket. Up until probably 30 years ago, a normal healthy cholesterol was probably in the neighborhood of 225 to 250. If you look at longevity, like people who live the longest, what is the average cholesterol range in those people? So these are the longest living people. It's 225 to 240. Now, modern cardiology and modern medicine has decided that you should be under 200 and that you should take medication to push your LDL, your so-called bad cholesterol, as low as possible. And that is just wrong. And these cholesterol drugs do not prolong life. They don't extend life. They are, they have side effects with brain, memory loss, uh, increased rate of diabetes, liver cancer. They're dangerous drugs. Cholesterol is one of the most important molecules in the whole body. Most of the cholesterol is actually manufactured by the liver. Only about 30% of it is dietary. And it's very carefully controlled. And what you have to do, I'm not saying that walking around with a cholesterol 400 is good, but once you get the biochemistry balanced, you, the cholesterol will come into a normal range for that person. Now, all the sex hormones are made out of cholesterol. The membranes in every cell are made out of cholesterol. Brain has a huge amount of cholesterol. And if you're taking one, one lab value and you're treating it, thinking that you're going to reduce heart disease, it isn't even true. Now, the big tragedy on heart disease is that 50% of the people who are asymptomatic, you know, they didn't go to their doctor because they had chest pain or shortness of breath or swollen ankles. 
50% of the diagnosis of heart disease for the first time is sudden death. The person had a, 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 an arrhythmia or a blockage in their heart, which caused a fatal rhythm and they died. Now that is a huge, big problem. So we screen people because cardiovascular disease is very common and it can come from bad teeth, from heavy metals, from chemical toxins, from bad diet. And so I'm very liberal about checking people. There's a, there's a kind of an x-ray you can do to see if there's calcium buildup in the heart. So anybody over probably 35, I send them to get an x-ray of their heart and is there calcium buildup? Because if there's high calcium buildup, there's a good chance they've got artery disease. You can go to the, what's it called? Um, it's like for 99 bucks, there's these buses that drive all over these towns and they'll do an ultrasound of your carotid and they'll do an EKG and they'll do a lifeline it's called. And they'll do a, a uh, and, and you can get screened for do you have plaque buildup in your arteries? I'm liberal about having people do either VO2 max testing or echo stress testing to try to discover, you know, does this person, especially if they have a family history of that, do they have artery buildup? So I think it's something that every doctor, no matter what they're doing, really needs to look at because it is, like you said, the number two killer. And, um, and it's, it's, it, there, there are things that, you know, this lifestyle and there's things that you can do to treat it so that you can keep people um, out of having to get bypasses and stents and all this other stuff. There's a technique that I believe that you use and some doctors use called EECP, mm -hmm. uh, where the, I think the Lakers were actually using it. Uh, yes. they, they, where they build up collaterals and more blood vessels around the heart. Yes. Is that something that you're still using? And can you explain the benefits of, of that technique to help people who may be having heart problems. Yeah, so ECP is a, it's a machine and it's a table that you lay on and there's a, what look like blood pressure cuffs go on the lower leg, upper leg and lower abdomen. And you have a heart rate monitor on so that the blood pressure cuffs, when the heart is, the heart is a, like a two phase cycle. So it squeezes, empties the blood out and then it relaxes and the heart fills. And when the heart is in the relaxing phase, the arteries to the heart, which feed the muscle, they pump blood to the heart muscle. Now the <clears throat> machine is coordinated so that when the heart is in the resting phase, the blood pressure cuff on the lower leg goes, the upper leg goes, <coughs> the one on the lower abdomen goes, and it forces a fluid wave of blood up from your, from your legs, up into your chest, up into your brain it triggers a hormone release. The hormone's called vascular endothelial growth factor. And this hormone sets in motion development of new blood vessels around areas where there hasn't been enough blood supply. So if you have a blocked heart artery, you get collateral circulation. You get blood vessels growing around. Now, the treatment was proven and is actually Medicare covered. So to get a Medicare covered treatment, there's really good science and many cases proving that this actually helps. It used to be that these were in many cardiologists office and they used them, but it's time intensive. It's only one patient per table per hour. You need an attendant there. And the Medicare reimbursement, I think, was like $8,000. And it was way easier to be able to find someone who's got blocked arteries and take them to the cath lab and put a stint in and make triple the money. And you could do several in a day and, the, and it was over. And so they went into disuse. So most cardiologists in their basement somewhere and they're, you know, they have these things or they had these things. And I heard about this and the, when I, the, actually the, the, a patient called me and said, I went to my cardiologist. She had, she had angina. She had signs that she was not getting enough blood to her heart. And she said, if you buy one of these machines, I'll be your first patient. So I investigated it and we bought one and she was our first patient. And we've done 
probably several thousand patients now over the last 20 years. In our experience, anyone who's got angina where they've got compromised blood vessels, the success rate is near 100%. It's 35 hours, so it's an hour a day for 35 days. So we do five days a week for seven weeks. If they come in with angina or exercise, rest, chest pain, 100% of the people that we've seen by day 17 out of the 35 are pretty much symptom free. It's really a good treatment. Now we combine that with chelation. So we're getting heavy metals out of them. And we do another treatment where we give them special phospholipids to soften up the, the, the blood vessels and make them more compliant. And we give them ozone, we give them a, a, a nutritional program. But the success rate's really high. And we've had patients where their, you know, their post heart attack, their ejection fraction, you know, the, the amount that the heart can pump is very low. The heart's been damaged. And we usually get at least a doubling within six weeks or seven weeks of their heart output. So it's remarkable. It's very safe. Um, it isn't very expensive. And um, you will be hard pressed to find a cardiologist who has one. The Lakers, there's a lady in uh, right around the, the Lakers stadium um, in Los Angeles, who's got 22 of these tables. And they would go after each game when they were at home games and they would each get on a table for, for an hour because it helped them with recovery. It like helped their circulation and pumped out all the lactic acid and they got a performance increase and they, you know, none of these guys have heart disease. They're all, you know, incredible fitness athletes, but um, they found that that was really beneficial. So um there are tables around and if you have, so I say to people, look, if you have, uh, you know, if you have stable heart disease and you want to get better, or you've been through the ringer with stints and you're not any better, this is a great treatment. And it's, you know, it's very safe and it, it, it really works. And just a question back about the statins for, for secondary prevention, Somebody's already had a heart attack. They're put on a statin by a cardiologist. At that point, is there any benefit to it? I don't believe there's any benefit to it. The only time I use a statin is in some cancer patients. Statin have, in, in some cancer patients, statins may have some anti-cancer activity. But I never use statins. Now, there are some people who may have hereditary hyperlipidemia. And they've had heart disease and blood vessel disease. And there might be some room in those cases where the drug might help them. But in 99% in of what I'm seeing, I'm usually taking people off the medication um, and virtually never putting them on. There's so many people now that have hypothyroid. You know, the thyroid's supposed to make a, what, about 200 milligrams of uh, thyroid hormone per day. Uh, now, if the thyroid is low, what does that put you at risk for? How does that affect the mitochondria? Well, the, the chief determinant of how well mitochondria perform is thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone is also the chief stimulus for how many mitochondria you have in a cell. And so they've done muscle biopsies on people where you could do electron micrographs, you know, blow the thing up a thousand times where you could count how many mitochondria are in that muscle cell in a patient that's got low thyroid. Now, I said earlier that the average number of mitochondria in a healthy cell is between 1,000 and 2,000. What you'll see in a patient that's low thyroid is that the mitochondria number might be 350, 500. It's low. And then you give them thyroid hormone to the point where their thyroid levels are what they should be, and you re-biopsy them, their mitochondrial count will double or triple. And no wonder they feel better because they can make more energy. Now it takes a few weeks to months for this to occur, but having low mitochondria and low ability to generate energy equals any disease you want. So the risk of cancer and heart disease and fatigue and name anything you want, 
is because there's low energy and thyroid is one of the most important things in getting cellular energy up to what it should be. Now, do you recommend that people just take T T4 or T3 and T4, you know, from a compounded lab or armor or synthroids enough in most people? I usually, we measure them. So we measure free T3, free T4, TSH, antibodies. Um, usually the desiccated thyroid, NP or armor works the best. Uh, sometimes you'll see people who have adequate T4 and low T3, they don't convert and they might just need T3. Some people are the other way around. So we tailor it to the patient probably 90% of the time the desiccated thyroid works. We start them on a low dose. We have them increase the dose every two weeks until their body feels warm. Their waist gets a little smaller. Their brain turns on. They feel more energetic. Then we'll remeasure a level and see if we're, if we're kind of in range. We usually want people to be at the high end of normal on the regular lab tests. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we do this bioenergy testing where um, if your resting metabolism is low, so normal is 100 to 110 on this machine. And um, if, uh, and the hypothyroid patients might be 70, 75. And even in some of those, the blood levels look okay, but they're hypothyroid. And so we give them thyroid until we get their, their bioenergy, their metabolism test up in 100, and they feel good. And then usually the blood levels look good. How does that bioenergy test work? What, what is that? It's a, it's, it, they're in a resting state and it measures the amount of oxygen that's breathed in and the amount of carbon dioxide that's breathed out. Now, you have VO2 know, max. No, no, max is they are exercising at full bore. Okay. How much oxygen could they utilize at maximum exercise? This is a resting metabolism. And if your mitochondria are working, Every oxygen that comes in, every O2 that comes in the body, if it were fully and efficiently processed, should result in a CO2. So if you measure oxygen in and CO2 out and there's a big gap, you know that the oxygen is getting in, but it's being wasted. The mitochondria is not able to convert that oxygen to the waste product of producing energy, which is CO2 and water, it isn't able to do it because the mitochondria is toxic or, or deficient, or it's not working. So in people who are very, who, are, who have thyroid levels that are normal and they're not too messed up in other areas, they, they will have um, uh, resting metabolism levels that are you know, 100, 105, and they're fine. Uh, their bodies are warm. They have good energy. Um, and so it's very helpful because sometimes the blood tests are hard to interpret as to, you know, whether somebody's okay or not. You know, the blood levels are very wide um, up to, as to what's normal. And so it's, it's, you know, in many endocrinologists' office, a person will come in and say, you know, I'm tired and my body's cold and I'm having trouble keeping it warm and I'm kind of constipated and my skin is dry. And geez, my eyebrows are thinning at the thing. And doc, I think I'm hypothyroid. And the doctor will do a TSH. It's a thyroid stimulating hormone. And the range of thyroid stimulating hormone in the labs we use is 0.5 to 4.5. And this person has a, a TSH level of 4.2. It's in the range. And very often the doctor will say, you're fine. This is normal for you. If I, want to, if I want to get a whole bunch of new patients, all I have to do is go to the health food store and put up a, put up a uh, I'm going to give a talk. And the title of the talk is, you think you're hypothyroid and your doctor thinks you're not. And you're right. Come here about why and how. Then I'll get 100 people in the back room of the health food store because this is the general experience. And then you measure these people and a TSH of four is way too high. You know, my standard is if it's above one and a half, there's something wrong. And they may need at that point, they might be iodine deficient and they're not making thyroid hormone or they might be amino acid deficient and they're not making thyroid hormone. 
uh, or their thyroid might be very inflamed or they have some kind of autoimmune condition and their thyroid isn't making thyroid hormone, but those people can be helped. And sometimes what they need is they just need some thyroid hormone. And then they, they, you know, within a few weeks, they feel like new people. I was hypothyroid. I didn't know it. So I have a low body fat and I was getting into the place where I swim. The water's is fairly cold. So it's a big Olympic pool and I'm in a group, a master swim program. And I just dreaded getting into that water because my body would get cold. And I have a picture of myself coming out of a triathlon. This was before wetsuits were allowed. So I, I was actually hypothyroid for a long time and didn't know it. But the water, it was Monterey Bay and the water temperature was 56 degrees and it was a half Ironman. So the swim was 1.2 miles. And we're swimming it without a wetsuit. And there's a picture of me coming out of the water and I am blue. And I was like just shivering. It took me an hour on the bike to just warm up. Okay. So I did this test and my, my resting metabolism was low and I started taking thyroid on the sort of program that we do it on. And when I got up to uh, 60 milligrams of, of desiccated thyroid, of, of armor thyroid, the pool is no longer cold. I have very good cold tolerance now. I found that, you know, sort of mental brightness was better. Energy was better. It's just like this can have, you know, a lot of people are walking around hypothyroid. They have no idea. How low would you say is acceptable? Is 0.1 acceptable of TSH? TSH. Huh? How low a TSH would you say is acceptable? I don't care what the TSH is. You don't I want the free T3 between three and a half and four. And I want the free T4 around 1.2 to 1.3. And I don't care if you give people thyroid, you are going to suppress their TSH and it's going to go low. And some doctors will say, well, it's too low. No, it's not. It's this is how much hormone it takes because I don't, the brain isn't made doing the job. You know, the brain thyroid combination isn't doing the job. And all I care is that the job gets done. So I give them enough where the symptoms are all gone and I don't care what the TSH is. And the T, free T3 and free T4 are usually 3.5, 3, 3.7, 3, up to four. And they have no symptoms of hyperthyroid. They're not, you know, they don't have a fast heart rate. They're not hyper. You know, they don't have their eyes aren't bulging out. They don't have any of the, any of the signs. And, and it works like a dream. I mean, the number of people that we add thyroid to are, are I don't know, probably 30% of the people that walk in my office, they're hypothyroid. Hmm. So you do a lot of work with cancer. Now, mammography, every woman, they tell to get a mammography, the x-ray, uh, it looks at the calcium. And if you get, do a mammography for eight, 10 years in a row, I've read statistics where there's, if you do it 10 years in a row, you increase your risk of getting uh, breast cancer uh, by close to 10 times. And I was wondering if, if you agree with that and what your opinion is on mammography versus some other alternatives like thermography or ultrasound? Yeah, so I don't like mammography. It's It picks up cancer late. So by the time an average woman is diagnosed by mammography with breast cancer, that cancer has been there between eight and 10 years. So it's a late, it's, it's late. There's also a high false positive rate where there's calcium and they get biopsied and there's nothing there. It's probably in the neighborhood of 20%, depending on the lab or on the x-ray place. There's also a false negative rate that's also in that range, 15 or 20%, where it shows something's there, but there's no cancer. So there's a wide margin of error. Now, Canada has disbanded mammography and so have most of the European countries because it hasn't been very valuable in early detection to prevent people or to get people diagnosed early with breast cancer. Uh, and it's, so it's just, a, and, it, and plus you have the danger of it's, it's x-ray, you know, so it's radiation. Radiation causes cancer. So I don't order it on people. Uh, thermography can be helpful. Um, I don't trust it completely. Ultrasound, manual exam, Sometimes we'd end up with a breast MRI if there's a question about something. So it is very important to be, to diagnose breast cancer as early as you can. Um, 
but I think the whole mammography world is is really behind the times and I don't, uh, you know, sometimes there are some x-ray places that won't do a breast MRI until there's been a mammography and they refuse to do it. So if push comes to shove, I might do that. But generally, I don't, I don't like it. I don't think it's a good test. MacU Health, your science born and tested solutions for visual performance, macular degeneration, and dry eye syndrome. New products coming soon. Embrace the science. The All Eyes Visual All VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields, acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. We're talking about the trophoblastic theory of cancer, some of the work of William Kelly, who was a dentist who treated cancer. Uh, you're an expert on that. Well, I, I know um, I, I know about it. <laughs> um, I interviewed, by yeah. the way, a Dr. Gonzalez, Mary Beth Gonzalez on my podcast. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Gonzalez spoke at our meeting. So uh, the late, uh, great Dr. Gonzalez. Yes. So amazing, amazing man. Uh, brilliant and true renegade. Uh, fearless. Um yeah, so there is something to it. It's, you know, cancer is very complicated. You know, nobody has a handle on it that's like, we cure cancer by doing X, Y, Z. We can help cancer by doing X, Y, Z. But uh, cancer, especially if it's not surgically removable, is a very big challenge. You know, in December of 1971, Richard Nixon declared war on cancer and said by the 1975, there would be a cure. Now we're hundreds of millions or billions of dollars down the line to try to figure out this stuff. The cure rate for cancer since then has improved only very marginally for many cancers. Uh, and it's... Um, and the rate of cancer is increasing at an exponential rate, even with all the modern diagnostic technology, mammograms, all the rest of the stuff. So the environment is, is killing people. It's producing cancer. And the treatment for cancer is, is, is very tough. And I, what I tell people with cancer is that you, 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 know, you should look carefully at what treatment you're going to get because there's a, it's a huge industry. There's a very interesting book called Cancer Inc. Uh, by Ralph Moss, um, where the people who make the drugs, finance the studies, uh, cherry pick the results to show things happened that really didn't. And so um, I was just saw a patient today who's, there's a lot of new medicines, these these, these monoclonal antibody medicines, which are the newest rage in cancer. And I think there may be a future for these, but if you look at the average life extension where the treatment might cost $100,000 a year or more is usually a matter of months, you know, the life extension. So there's a long way to go. And I think that um, what's happening now is that there is more and more an outcry from public and for coming to clinics like ours where people have had bad you know results and they want to try something that's less harmful and I don't I never promise anybody that I'm going to cure their cancer but I know that what we do isn't going to hurt them and it's going to improve their health and a lot of times we get improvement and so um, it's you know and I think as more and more people go this way the industry is going to loosen up and there's going to be more and better research and and that the, I think the future of it, um, especially in recognizing that the biggest factors are what's your vitamin D level and how's your food and how's your social environment, that these are very important things in handling cancer patients and in preventing cancer. And the studies on chemo, 
does that really extend life? Well, not, not much. I mean, if you have disease that's outside of the organ, there was a very interesting study done in 2002, both half of it was done in Australia and half of it was done in the United States, where they looked at how many months extension or what was the five year extension of life in patients, half of whom got chemotherapy and half of them got other therapies for their cancer. And the extension of life uh, was there was only a 2% difference in life extension by adding chemotherapy. And the editorial, now this is a mainline cancer journal. The editorial in that journal, which is 2002, so it's 20 years ago, was maybe we ought to reconsider chemotherapy as our main treatment for cancer. Because if we're only getting a 2% increase in five-year survival, maybe we ought to be looking in a different way. Now that's been ignored, but I think it remains true today. Like it's not, it's, it's not, you know, it's not the golden calf. It is not the delivering thing, except, you know, there are some cases of lymphoma and Hodgkin's lymphoma where you can definitely prolong five and 10 year survival with high dose chemotherapy. Okay. I don't know about after that. My best friend had Hodgkin's when she was 16. She got high dose chemo. She was in remission for, for uh, about 15 years and then got a secondary cancer and then died. So it helped her. I mean, it saved her life. Um, many of the testicular cancers, um, the, the high dose chemo programs, probably 90% cure rate. So some of it's really good, uh, but those are, the, those are the exceptions. How about some of the natural therapies for the cancer, like Laetril or IV vitamin C, uh, ozone, uh, some of the herbs? They're, they're all good, but if you've got, you know, you've got a real cancer, especially if it's not surgically removable. Cancer today is not the same disease as it was 25 or 50 years ago. It's way worse. And the number of people that I come in and say, they did Chris Cure's cancer program, or they drank carrot juice, or they did Gerson. The number of those people that actually get cured that I see are very, very few. And we have some people that come in and they say, I want only natural therapies. So, cause we do some low dose, it's called IPT, some low dose chemotherapy with people. And the ones who say, I don't want any of that stuff, I just want IV vitamin C or ozone or methylene blue or all this. We do all this stuff. Uh, doesn't work usually. It just doesn't work. Cancer's too, it's just too bad. You know, I don't know if I can say this. It's just too, it's just too bad. It's too rough. It's too tough. It's and that if you do all this stuff with low dose chemotherapy, hyperbaric oxygen, all this other stuff, which we do, yeah, now you can help. And the low dose chemo doesn't make people sick and their hair doesn't fall out and they, they do very well with it. And the stem cells, the, ke the chemo, I guess, could kill cancer cells, but it won't kill the stem cell, which is the mother cell. Right, right. You know, so now with biopsies, what do you think about getting frequent biopsies for cancer? Are we puncturing the, the protective coat around the cancer and can that release cancer cells? It how definitely. Do you, how do you, how do you, in your mind, when it comes to biopsies, how do you figure that out? How many to do? Most of the time, we can do a liquid biopsy, which is blood. That the circulating tumor cells are in the blood. We can send it to a laboratory where they can isolate the circulating tumor cells. They can profile them as to what their genetics are and what their sensitivities are. And that that's in most cases is enough. If you have other strong evidence, you know, you've got a PET scan or an MRI or other blood markers where you're certain that this is cancer. And then we get those same cells out of the blood that then we don't have to do a secondary biopsy. So usually that's how we handle it. Is there a risk for doing frequent biopsies where you're taking a piece of the tissue? Well, I mean, the, 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 the organ early on is trying to contain the cancer. And so if you start sticking needles through it, you are gonna puncture it. The cells are gonna get out. 
And I think you increase your risk of spreading the disease if you're doing, you know, with biopsies. I mean, I think it's a risk. It might be in some cases a legitimate risk, but we find that in most of the cases, we don't have to do it. And the cancer likes sugar, likes glutamine. Uh, most of them do. Most so of them. do you recommend that they stay away from sugar and glutamine? Well, we put them on a ketogenic diet. If, they, if the PET scan shows that this is a high sugar loving tumor, um, we put them on a very low carb diet, 12 grams a day of carbs. Um, and 80% uh, of the calories are fat. Um, and that does help people. Some cancers aren't glucose loving. They'll take fatty acids, you know, they'll eat anything. So if it's one of those, I'm, I'm not so strict. I want them organic. I want them paleo. Uh, they may be able to eat some fruit, but in the hardcore aggressive ones, we try to keep them on keto. And how about glutamine? Well, I don't ever use glutamine as a supplement. Uh, glutamine is an amino acid, so it's in, it's in all the proteins that they're eating. So I, I wouldn't, some people use glutamine for helping here to, to with intestinal permeability. Um, so I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't give them extra glutamine or glycine. As we finish up, I want you to talk about, if you can, about the amino acids. Uh, you're very interested in that. Uh, if somebody has a hamstring problem, they have uh, plantar fasciitis, and they can't get it better. And it, you have a, a beautiful way of explaining the that it's the amino acids are like an alphabet. And if you could explain that to the audience. Okay. So people think of protein as the important, you know, that there's three macronutrients. There's proteins and fats and carbohydrates. And that we have a requirement for protein of 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight or whatever the whatever the the cdc tells you that you're supposed to have we don't really have a protein requirement proteins are made up of smaller units so it's like an alphabet so these smaller units are called amino acids amino in greek means nitrogen so these are compounds that have nitrogen fats and carbohydrates don't have nitrogen so if you eat a steak or some eggs or some soybeans, you take it in your stomach. If you're able to digest it completely, that muscle protein gets broken down into individual amino acids because the body can't absorb the whole protein. It's too big. It has to have very teeny units, these amino acid units. Now, one muscle fiber, which is microscopic, so you couldn't see a muscle fiber on a table. It's too, too skinny. One muscle fiber has about 5,000 amino acids in it. And it's like sort of beads, like a pattern of beads. You have the, the template says, put a red one on, then a gold one, then an orange one, then a white one. The amino acids to be muscle fiber have to be in a certain pattern. So there's 22 amino acids. And if those aren't available in the muscle cell, let's say you just worked out, you tore some of your muscle fibers, you want to heal them, you got to get those amino acids, those 20 amino acids to that cell so that it can make new strings of fibers of muscle. Now, we started measuring levels of amino acids, fasting levels in people's blood. And we found that, that probably 85 or 90% of people had low levels of certain amino acids. And if you don't have those amino acids, you can't, if the, if the cell, if the template in the muscle cell says, okay, I need a gold one and a blue one and a red one. And there's no store of the red ones in that muscle cell that muscle won't be built. It won't substitute it, it will stop. Now, there's about 200,000 different proteins in the body, which are every day being remade, broken down, repaired, rebuilt. And so you need a good supply 
of what are called essential amino acids. These are, there are eight of them. And with the eight, the body can make all 22. And so what we found is that people had major deficiencies in essential amino acids, even some high, high end athletes. I worked with some of the, you know, guys who were, were top tier Tour de France cyclists, you know, guys who won the Ironman World Championship, where I measure their amino acid levels and they weren't optimized. So we put together a product that's called Perfect Amino. It has eight, the eight essential amino acids and they're in a special form so that they maximize muscle and protein building. And we found that we put people on these products and we started to get success stories. Like my plantar fasciitis feels better. My thyroid's better. You know, my hair's growing too faster. My nails are now hard. My energy is increased. And we found when in patients where we were detoxing their heavy metals that um, we got a 30% increase in speed of detoxification if we had, if we were supplementing them with perfect amino. So this is a great product. Nowadays, the biggest challenge with proteins is many, many people don't have acid in their stomach because they're taking Pepsid or Nexium or Propulsid or one of these drugs because they got heartburn. And without acid in your stomach, you're not going to digest protein. You're not going to absorb minerals either. And you're setting yourself up a big risk for, for cancer and for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and for parasite infestation. So, you know, $5 billion a year is spent on the pharmaceutical drugs that do this. And that doesn't even count the over-the-counter ones. So most people aren't digesting their protein. And then every other person has, you know, yeast, bacteria, <clears throat> their intestinal, they're, they're gluten sensitive and they're eating gluten and they don't absorb them. So when we look in their blood, we find their amino acid levels are low. So we give them perfect amino and they repair everything because they can get amino acids in. they don't need stomach acid. They don't need digestive enzymes. They repair their body. And it's a very big It's important that people take digestive enzymes before they eat or do take with, with, with the food. With, you want it in there. I tell them, take it halfway through your meal. You don't want them there before. You want it in the middle of the meal. And how about hydrochloric acid uh, to take some at? We, Body Health, we make one that's got both together. So you take it so both. So the capsule, it's got hydrochloric acid and pancreatic enzyme. And if they're taking the perfect, <laughs> if they're taking the perfect amino, should they also take the uh, digestive enzymes with it? To help it's, absorb it better? No, because perfect amino is already pre-digested. You don't need enzymes for perfect amino. It goes right in. But they're going to eat food as well, and they need it to digest their food. And I think in the perfect amino, you leave out histidine. Is that correct? Well, we don't add histidine because it's not an essential amino acid. Okay, so it's not one of the essential ones. Right. We did a study where we, we measured blood levels of histidine, fasted levels of histidine, and then gave them perfect amino. And 30 and 60 minutes later, looked in their blood to see what happened to their histamine level, histidine levels, and their histidine levels went up. The body will make histidine if you give it perfect amino. Now, there are certain foods that will turn into proteins better than others. So eggs, I believe, are the best. Mm -hmm. uh, and what are some of the foods that, how's turkey, chicken, beef, uh, which is- Turkey, it? chicken, beef, fish. So there's a scale of like, how good is this protein at, if it got in your body and it got digested, could your body take those amino acids and make its own proteins? And so perfect amino is at the top of the scale. 99% of the perfect amino gets made into your body protein. The next best food is breast milk. It's 49. It's hard to get. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I have a, eight grandchildren and one of them, uh, so there's a new baby, my granddaughter's nursing and the five-year-old wanted a taste. Okay. <laughs> so his mother squirted some out and gave it to him. And he, he, uh, he, he didn't nurse from her, but he, he took a sip from a cup and he took it and he smiled. And my, my, uh, my daughter-in-law said, what, you know, why are you smiling? 
well, like, what does it taste like to you? And he said, oh, it tastes just like chocolate. <laughs> what a great anyway, so eggs are 48. Um, meat, fish, uh, uh, poultry are 33. Uh, dairy is 17. Soy is 17. Collagen is zero. Collagen is the big push now. Everybody, they're pushing collagen on people for their hair and their nails. You see any benefit for that? No, I mean, you have to, collagen is missing one of the eight essential amino acids. There's no tryptophan in collagen. So if you just did collagen for your protein, you're not going to get very far. Um, it's, um, it's not harmful, but if you want bang for your buck, use perfect amino. You do so many great things in, in your office. And I just want to, before we finish, to brag about some of the things that you do. Talk about ozone and what how that benefits people. And I know that after there's a lightning storm, you go outside and it smells so fresh. I guess yeah. ozone is being made. Yes, that's right. Ozone is O3. And we breathe O2. And when lightning hits an O2, it splits it into O1s and O1s don't stay by themselves. They're, they're, they're groupies. So some of the O1s combine back to make O2 and some of the O1s combine with an O2 to make O3 and O3 is ozone. And ozone is what our, what our white blood cells use to kill cancer cells and bacteria. It's a natural compound produced in the body. Our body can take O2 that, excuse me, that we breathe and it can add an oxygen and make O3. It also detoxifies. Ozone has a minus charge and it will bind to chemicals and toxins and take them out of circulation. It also immune boosts people. So you get an enhanced immune response. And in people who are healthy, it increases VO2 max, it increases mitochondrial function and performance. So it's like the antidote to about anything. Uh, and so we use a lot of ozone in our clinic because people who have viruses or fatigue or cancer, ozone is very effective in helping them to uh, get better. And what's the best way to take to get ozone? Well, we do it all a number of ways. We do it IV. Um, you can put it in joints. You can put it in bladders. It helps healing. It regenerates cartilage. Um, uh, you can. We do it also in a sauna. So it's a steam sauna. How do you do it in a sauna? How do you get the ozone in the sauna? We just pipe it in. It's a you gas. You just pipe it in. So it's a sauna where your head out. You can't breathe ozone. That's the only place you can't put it. Okay. So it's a, it's a space capsule because ozone breaks down everything. So it's a fiberglass space capsule. You sit in it. It's closed so that your head's out because we don't want you breathing the ozone. And then it's steam. So it's like 106 degrees with steam, with ozone. It dilates up all your pores and the ozone floods into the body. And you, you sweat and you detoxify. And you also have Ebo in your, in your office. Explain that. Ebo is, is blood filtration. It's a dialysis machine where blood comes out one arm, goes through the machine, the blood gets filtered. So the impurities that are in the blood or the particulates that are in the blood get filtered out. And then the blood goes back. Before it goes back to you, it's ozonated. And then you do it for about an hour. So it, it does your whole circulation multiple times. And it just is a supreme detoxifier. Like it cleans people out. And, it, and that's very good for people with fibromyalgia. Yeah, anybody with any chronic condition is really good for it. And it's like a once a week therapy? Um, yeah, I mean, you, most people don't need too many, four to eight usually you know, once a week for four to eight weeks. We usually get them used to the ozone first because the ozone in the Ebu is a high dose. So I want to make sure they're okay with it first. Um, and then we would go to the Ebu. One of the things that you do that I just find that it's amazing is that plaques therapy, the IV plaques. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the PC that you're, that it actually helps uh, decrease arther atherosclerosis. Can you talk about, about that a little bit? Yeah, the, the, the phospholipids, which are the things that make up the membranes in every cell wall, get oxidative stressed and they get damaged. So then the membrane itself is not functioning correctly to allow communication in and out. And Plaquex is a way to give IV phospholipids and the cell will take up the new ones and dump the bad ones. 
so that you can restore your cell membrane. So the flexibility and the communication uh, terminals that are on the cell improve. And so uh, it's a wonderful treatment. And how about pl uh, plasmalogens? We need another hour. Yeah. <laughs> uh, plas plasmalogens are, are blood measurements of the, of the phospholipids. And so people who have memory loss and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and cancer and cardiovascular disease, they have damaged, they have low levels of plasmalogens. So there's a lab, we can measure them. And then there are supplements to, to improve them. Uh, so we measure this stuff in people. And if they need it, that's part of the add-on treatment. And my last two, you do dark field. Tell us about the benefits of dark field. Well, I learned dark field. I, I, was, I was an infectious disease doctor. So I was trained at University Hospital in San Diego and the, the, the chairman of the department, every afternoon we would sit and we would look at, at, at microscopic specimens from the patients that were in the hospital. And if, there was, if a person was suspected of having syphilis, we would take their blood and look at it under the microscope because you could often see the syphilitic bacteria on this microscope. So that's where I learned how to do it. We do it today because Lyme disease is in the same family as syphilis. It's not syphilis, it's not sexually transmitted, but it's a spirochete. And you can often see these spirochetes on a specimen if you look at the blood. You can also see other things. You can see buildup of biotoxins. What we're seeing now in the long COVID patients is that the interaction between either the virus or the vaccine and the patient produces clumps of platelets. Platelets are the things that cause blood clotting. But a platelet is supposed to be have a certain size, small size. And what we find in these long COVID patients is that the platelets clump together and they form microclots. You've probably seen some of this stuff in the literature where embalmers can't get their fluid to go through the veins. And someone who's passed away because the, the thing is clotted up. And you see these people with, you know, heart attacks in young people or clots in young people. And we now can see on the microscope, hey, look, this guy has microclots, big gigantic platelets all over the place and they're high risk for clots. And so we do a lot of stuff to try to get those clots to break up so that, the, so that we can prevent them from getting some kind of occlusive event. Have you had luck in breaking up the clots and what have you used? Yeah, I mean, sometimes the natural stuff works and sometimes- Kinase, uh, one more kinase, that type of thing? That type of thing, fish oil. But sometimes in the bad ones, you got to add real drugs. You know, Plavix and aspirin because they're not, it, the natural stuff isn't strong enough. Uh, and my last question is, we talked about it a little bit before, what's the negative of being on a vegetarian diet and the positive? I know you were on a vegetarian diet at one time. Uh, what's the pros and cons of, of being on a vegetarian diet? Well, the pros are that you get a lot of fiber and you get a lot of, you get a lot of nutrients, you get minerals and you get vitamins. Those are all good things. Um, the con is that the protein quality in vegetables is, and, and, and vegetarian diet is very low, you know, on that scale, rice proteins, probably. And remember I gave you that scale of hundred perfect aminos, 99, uh, rice proteins, probably eight or 10, the spirulina products are below five. They're just not any good. So people who have been on a vegetarian diet, now this isn't all, but it's most, when I measure their serum amino acid levels, I can tell right away, you're a vegetarian, aren't you? They don't even have to tell me because their amino acids are all in the toilet. Now, for the first probably three to six months, most people feel better because they're getting fiber, they're going to the bathroom, they're getting nutrients that they didn't get before. But then their body starts to break down and their hormone levels go down and their energy goes down and their muscles go down. Again, it's not everybody, but it's most. Now, if you want to be a vegetarian, which is, you know, it's a personal choice, the you have to take perfect amino at least two or three doses every day because you've got to get your amino acids in you're not going to get them from the food that you're eating if you're overweight vegetarian diets are all high carb diets all the vegetable proteins are high carb all the fruits and vegetables are high carb 
And if you have high insulin and you're diabetic and you want to lose weight, it's very hard on a vegetarian diet. Now, I'm not making a 100% statement here, but this is just most people. B12 levels are a problem in vegetarian diets. So you got to watch out for that. Iron is also um, can go low because the available iron in plant foods is not very good. So if I've got a vegetarian, I'm checking their B12, I'm checking their iron, and I'm checking their omega-3 fats. So one of the profiles is how it is your DHA. That is the essential um, omega-3 fat. In many vegetarians, they're eating omega-3 fats in the form of walnuts or flax, but it's not DHA. It's linoleic acid, linolenic acid. And, and the body then has to convert it into DHA, which is the molecule that, that we really need. And the conversion doesn't happen. So some of these people need to take a, an omega-3. Some of the algaes work, some of them don't. They could do krill, they can do fish, you know, and if they're fine, they're fine. But these are the sort of things that you just have to pay attention to if you're going to do vegetarianism and stay healthy. So I have a lot of patients from India that are, that are for rel religious reasons, they're vegetarians or vegans. And they are, they are very sick. Yeah. In general, they're very, they don't do well. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the diabetic, obesity, cardiovascular disease is high in those populations, in that population. So they can do it, but you know they need coaching on it so that they you measure these things, measure their amino acids, measure their omega-3 fats, measure their iron levels, measure their B12 levels, and then supplement as needed uh, to get them in the range that they they should be in if they want to be healthy. I want to thank Dr. Minkoff for joining me today. He's amazing. He makes very complicated things very easy. Uh, people want to find out more about you. They want to become a patient. They're, they've been to 13 doctors already and nobody's helping them. How could they do that? So our clinic website is LifeWorks Wellness Center. So it's L-I-F-E. W O R K S wellnesscenter.com. There's hundreds of videos on there that you can watch. You can learn about us. You can call, you can talk to somebody if you're interested in becoming a patient. Um, if you're interested in any of the products, the company is called body health. So it's bodyhealth.com. We talked about fish oil, about greens, about reds, about um, multivitamins, uh, and so we have uh, probably 25, 30 products. They're all super high quality that can be purchased from health practitioners or on our website over the internet. And uh, there's uh, hundreds of videos on there too. So if you, if you wanna learn more about particular topics, uh, you can. I do a newsletter every week and you can sign up for it, it's free. Uh, we have a huge number of people that get it and most people like it and I, write a, you know, the first part of it is some communication for me about what's going on in the world or something I've learned. And um, you can subscribe to that on either of the websites. And your book, how can they get the book? The book is called The Search for the Perfect Protein. Uh, it's an Amazon bestseller. You can buy it on Amazon. If you want just the downloaded version, you can go to bodyhealth.com and there's a PDF version that you can download if you want to read it that way. Well, thank you, Dr. Minkow, for giving us so much time and explaining so many complicated things to my audience and helping them become healthier. This is Dr. Kerry Gell for Open Your Eyes. Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromycel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and micromycel technology. The All Eyes Visual All VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields, acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, 
and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. Fitting multifocal contact lenses presents a big opportunity to meet patient needs while growing your practice. Alcon is your partner, not only with our innovative portfolio, but through e-learning. Learn to enhance your multifocal strategy today with the Alcon Experience Academy. OIE Broadcasting is the emerging leader in social media. We use scientific entertainment to drive more patients into your office. Visit OIEbroadcasting.com and sign up today. Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I bring extra and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You is because it's safe for me and you.